You ever read the Word of God? You ever get into it and you put yourself in a first-person kind of place where you're reading the Word and it says that the people of God should do this. And you think, well, I'm a people of God. I should do this then. So you kind of kind of put the words in your mind. Uh, for instance, like if you go into, uh, say, Psalms 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So to put that in the first person, you say, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Even, <clears throat> oh, sorry, I got to skip to the other chapter. He who dwells, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, now that is in first person already, so you can just read that straight ahead. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. So you see what I'm talking about. Well, I was reading this week, and I, was, I came across a scripture, and I thought, Lord, I am so thankful for that scripture. And here's where it was. It was in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. And it's the Lord talking. He says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake. And I will not remember your sins. I think, wow. Hallelujah. He won't remember. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake. And I will not remember your sins. I thought, wow. Thank you, Lord. And he said, go ahead. You say it. You say it in first person. And I thought, that? And I said, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember your sins. He says, I challenge you. Take that scripture and apply it to the people that you run into every day. Say to them, say to your spouse, say to your kids, I, even I, am he who will not remember your transgressions. I will blot out your sin. I said, God, I don't have the power to forgive sins. He said, sure you do. If somebody sins against you, you have full ability to forgive them for what they've done to you. Now, I challenge you. Go ahead and take that and run with it. And anybody that's crossed your path, in other words, <clears throat> I, even and I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake. And I, thought, and I said, Lord, you know, I'm a little kid. You know, since we're on this subject, <clears throat> I've always wondered. I've read that scripture and read that scripture and wondered, why do you tell me it's for your sake that you forgive my sin? Why is it for your sake? I, you know, I can understand this for my sake because I'd go to hell. You know, if you didn't forgive my transgressions, I, I got a penalty to pay here. But you tell me in your word, you blot out my transgressions for your sake. So he said, we'll put it in the first person. And you, you're looking at your spouse and you're saying to her or him, you know, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake. Oh. There's a freedom to letting go. There is a freedom to letting go of somebody who's wronged you. Because now, what I want you to see <clears throat> is that this is love talking. God is love. And so love in the first person saying this in Isaiah. Love says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember your sins. So love says, I'm not going to hold it against you. Love says, I know you've wronged me, but I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm going to let go of it. And it's for my sake, because I have such a compassion and a heart over you that I want to see you succeed, and I want to see you whole, and I want to see you healed, and I want to see you strong, and I don't want to see this eat you up from the inside out. So I'm telling you, let go of it. And for my sake, because I've got this love I want to pour over you, I'm going to be frustrated until I get to put my compassion all around you. I'm going to be frustrated until I get to have a relationship with you one-on-one. -on -one. And as long as you hold on to unforgiveness, that's not love. That's not me. So let go of it. Become love. Become like me. Take my spirit upon you. Follow my example. I'm your dad, right? Follow the example. So let go. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12 says, I, for I, this is the Lord talking again, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. He forgets on purpose. On purpose. He looks at us and says, I'm not going to remember it anymore. As far as the east is from the west, I'm going to blot it out. It's gone. So don't you remember it. Don't have a sin consciousness. In other words, if you ask for forgiveness, absolutely, don't get it wrong. See that he is quick and merciful and, and willing and ready to forgive and to forget. 
And just let me encourage you, like he told me a long time ago, if there is forgiveness, there is no more story. So don't walk around telling stories on people about how they had once did this or how. No, forgiveness blots it all out, erases it all. No, no, no remembrance, no story. Thank God. All right, we'll quit meddling. All right, raise your Bible up, your phone up, whatever you got the word on. Say, this is my Bible. Bible. I am am. who it says I am. I have have. what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God, I will never be the same, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, the Bible says, confess your faults to one another. When, when I first came back into the pulpit again, after being out as long as I was, I was nervous about that confession, because I hadn't said it for so long. And I, I was thinking, now, am I going to remember all that when I get up in front of everybody, you know, and start saying that? Well, I don't remember it. It comes from here because it's gotten in my spirit. So I get up and I just start saying it and it just starts flowing. And I'm not really thinking about it. It's coming out of the inside. And that's the way the word of God will be to you if you can get it put in your heart. I'm not talking about putting it in your head. And I'm not sure I shared with you last week how during the time I was recovering, how I would listen to preachers on TV. And some of them fed this, but they didn't feed this. And then when I turned to the ones that fed this, there's a big difference. Oh, amen. amen. It's a big difference in getting it in your head and getting it in your heart. That's why it's important to meditate on the Word of God. Meditate means just mutter to yourself. Just speak the Word. You know, you'll believe what you say. Yes. Amen. amen. Uh, I have sometimes, after a sermon, somebody will come up and go, well, now, what about, you know, what about that? And I'll go, well, what about that? (laughs) And we have a difference of opinion sometimes. Well, that's okay. But you'll believe what you believe. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, what we're talking about is uh, time for a comeback. Say, it's time for a comeback. comeback. And this is a part two of the message last week. So I'm going to review a little bit for those of you that maybe weren't here. Everybody can have a comeback. Say that with me. Everybody can have a comeback. All right. And a comeback starts where? Starts in your thinking, all right? Comeback starts in your thinking. And the example we use with prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son ran off with all his stuff that the father gave him, went to a foreign country, spent it all on wine, women, and song, and one day the money all ran out, and he ended up in the pig pen. And not only was he in the pig pen, but he was hungry. Here's a little Jewish boy, and they didn't raise pigs back home, all right? And here he is in the pig pen, and he's hungry. And it says in the scripture, it says he came to himself. So for you to have a comeback, you've got to come to yourself. You've got to be like a prodigal son, and you've got to get yourself by the ear and say, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? As one person said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. All right. So you've got to get to a point and you're thinking that I am not going to continue on this way. We had a preacher years ago Gary Hash, and he said, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. So it's time for a change. Turn your neighbor and say, it's time for a change. It's time for a change. Say, it's time for a comeback. All right. We, we can get stuck in a rut. Yes, amen. And one person said, a rut is a grave with both ends kicked out of it. All right. So we can just get in a rut in life. And just keep on with the same issues, the same problems, the same thought patterns, and just go day after day after day in misery. And God didn't have that in His plan for your life. And we'll see a little bit later what His plan is. So, He got tired of living the way He was living. Are you tired of living the way you're living? I believe some of you are. The response of the prodigal's father shows us that God is quick to run to our aid when we turn toward Him. 
What does the scripture say the father was doing every day? He's looking for that son. And God is looking for us to have a comeback in our lives. He's not up there going suffer, suffer, suffer. He's like, put my word to work in your life and watch my word work for you and have a comeback. Yes. Amen? Amen? Now, it doesn't happen by going to God and just crying to God and crying to God and crying to God. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Now, I'll be honest with you. Some days in my recovery, I did have that prayer. <laughs> oh, God, help me. All right? But he's not moved by that. He, he can't do anything with that. Everybody say self-pity. When you have a pity party, guess who shows up? The devil. And he'll start putting all kind of thoughts in your mind as to how bad it's going to be. You know, when I got on the Internet and I saw people that had uh, quadruple bypass surgery and the complications that got into those people's lives, I sat there and went, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I am so thankful to be standing here in front of you today. And I don't have any of that going on in my life. Matter of fact, I'm less one medication today. God. Hallelujah. I got one other medication been cut in half. Hallelujah. I'm having a comeback. Because God loves me more than you. No, no. no He doesn't. I was waiting for that answer. He doesn't love me more than you. He loves all of us the same. And He is moved by faith, not by our circumstances. When I was pitiful, He, he saw me being pitiful, but He couldn't do anything about it. Amen. Amen. I had to get powerful. I had to get the word coming out of my mouth. Yes. I had to make those confessions somebody gave me. Right. I had to be looking to him to restore health to me, which he said he would do. Amen. Amen. So what the father shows us is we don't have to do this alone. You know, we Americans, we are just so arrogant. <laughs> we are just so arrogant. We got so much will. You know, I was talking yesterday about my doctor and, and he's a very arrogant man. But I thank God for him. Uh -huh. His arrogance pushes him to be excellent in what he does. Yes. So I don't have a problem with his arrogance. All right. But we Americans are really arrogant. And we think we can just do anything. Well, I got news for you. When it comes to a comeback, you're not going to do it on your own. Amen. You're going to need God's help. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to need supernatural things going on in your life. Sometimes we forget that as a human being especially a born-again child of God, we are not just natural. We are supernatural. And we have abilities, we have resources, we have strengths within us that normal humans don't have out there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Say, God's good. God is good. All the time. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time for my comeback. It's time for my comeback. Say it one more time. It's time for my comeback. It's time for my comeback. Uh, last week we looked at Samson's life. And even though Hebrews 11 lists him as a hero of faith, he's listed in there with the big guys. We see when we look at his life that he was very human. And he was very self-willed. And I know some of you. <laughs> and I know how self-willed some of you are. And I know how determined some of you are that, bless God, I can get this done. All right? But then one day you run into that brick wall that you can't get done. And then you begin to feel <laughs> helpless and hopeless sometimes that how am I going to get through this? How, how am I going to get over this? How am I going to get around this? Am I going to dig under this? How, how am I going to get to the next place I need to get to? Everybody say, with God's help. With God's help. You got to quit your stinking thinking that you have to do this all by yourself. Yes. And you lean on Him. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And He will empower you to do what you need to do. He'll help you lose weight. Amen. 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 He'll help you find a better job. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We've had people in this congregation that got the pink slip. Not by any fault of their own. Just the company went kabooey. And they got the pink slip and they had to, they had to do something else. And God led them to a better place. Yep. Amen. Julie Taylor used to sit up there in the booth up there. She wanted to be a police officer. She is a police officer. And she's going back to school again and get more degrees. And Lord knows where that girl will end up sure. in regard to education and position and so forth. I'm hoping she'll come back one day and share all that with us. Amen? Amen. Say, God is good all the time. So in Samson's life, 
God gave him assignment. He made him a judge over uh, the people, uh, the Jewish nation then. Their main enemies were the Philistines. And his job was to defeat the Philistines. You all have a calling in life as to what God wants you to do. God has called us to raise six children. And we did that by the grace of God. God's called us to pastor. And we're doing that by the grace of God. So God's called you to do things. It may not be fivefold ministry, but He's called you to do what He's called you to do. Amen? Amen. And He'll give you the equipping to do that. I can remember when I worked secular jobs, and anybody, the first day on the job, it's just overwhelming. You know, uh, I was just talking with Sarah last Sunday here in the foyer, and she started a new job, and the first thing that they do is come in and three, uh, lay down, I think she said, three big binders of information and said, you need to learn all this. Yeah. Well, how many know that's overwhelming? Very. You know, so the first day on the job is kind of overwhelming. But then there's the second day, and then there's the fifth day, and then there's the 17th day, and then there's the 35th day, and then pretty soon it's like, man, I got this. I got this. <laughs> right? I can do this job. And then pretty soon you find better ways to do that job. Right. And you go to the supervisor, and they go, I don't want to hear it. Because <laughs> <that right? laughs> they don't want you looking smarter than them. But anyway, <laughs> that's another whole subject. All right, so Samson, he was called to do what he was called to do, but he followed his desires more than God's. So where are you on the obedience scale? You know, one thing they kept asking me in the hospital, what's your pain level? Is it zero to ten? Where is it in there? Who knows? I mean, who really knows the answer to that? It's either ten or nothing, as far as I'm concerned. Give me the pill. Right? I mean, what number do I have to give you to give me the pill right now? Because I want the pill. All right. So where are you on the obedience scale with God? Are, are you two in regard to obedience? Are you four in regard to obedience? Are you eight in regard to obedience? Or are you ten in regard to obedience? Now, Samson was all over the scale when you read about his life. And some of you are that way sometimes. You're just all over the place in regard to your obedience, all right? The Bible tells us that the test of this life is obedience. God. Well done, thou good and faithful. All right, it's about faithfulness. It's about obedience, doing what God's called you to do. Yeah, I need to get quiet here. Amen. Okay. Amen. So just like God gave Samson supernatural power to overcome his enemies, he's given us the Holy Spirit. Say, I have the Holy Spirit. Have the Holy Spirit. Spirit. To assist me. And overcoming my enemy. Now, Samson eventually was deceived, and we all deal with that too on a daily basis. Satan's toolbox, number one tool he brings out is deception. deception. All right? He's trying to deceive us into doing things we shouldn't be doing, or thinking things we shouldn't be thinking, or acting ways we shouldn't be acting. Amen? He is the great deceiver, the Bible says. All right? So, deception's a big deal. So, Samson got deceived, and because of his deception, he was captured by his enemies, he was placed in prison, and he was forced to tread out grain to feed them. Talk about humiliating. Here's this mighty man of God, equipped with the supernatural power of God to defeat his enemies, and now he's been captured by them through deception. And Satan will do that to you. He'll come to you with deception. You don't need to go to church. You don't need to go to church. Just stay home. You need your rest. Everybody say deception. deception. The Bible says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, but say it, much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, this wonderful testimony about being in a place that people love them. Some of you just need to be loved on a little bit. That's one reason to come to church. Some of you need to get inspired. Amen. So you can go out and walk the walk the rest of the week. Amen. You know, there's a little poster I saw one time. It said, seven days without God makes one week. Yep. W-E-A-K. Amen. Not W-E-E-K. All right. So we need each other. We need the support of one another. So don't be deceived into thinking that you can do it on your own. Because if you watched any Predator movies, and I don't recommend those. But if you watched any. <laughs> just because I've seen them doesn't mean you need to see them. <laughs> But if you watch any predator movies, who is the predator waiting on? The wheat. Is he waiting on the herd? Nope. Nope. 
He's waiting on the newborn whatever, or he's waiting on the sickly one that can't keep up with the herd. You know, that's the one he's going to attack. He's not going to jump in the middle of the herd. Here's our herd. Amen. Amen. And he ain't going to jump in the middle of you when you're here surrounded by love and you're surrounded by faith and you're surrounded by prayer. So we need each other. Amen. Amen. And we need to be obedient to what God calls each of us to do. So the statement I, I shared last week, which was from another preacher I got it from, he says, when you feed what you should be fighting, you're in bondage to the enemy. When you feed what you should be fighting, you're in bondage to the enemy. So Samson got in a place, he was feeding his enemy. And you've got to watch in your thought life, you're not feeding that enemy. You're not going down that path that he's, he's trying to bring you to and thinking his stupid thoughts. The Bible says, guard your mind. Amen? You've got to guard it. You've got to watch what you think about. As Joyce Meyer says, you don't have to think about everything that comes into your head. You can stop the thinking, stinking thinking right now. The Bible says, think upon those things that are good and pure and lovely and good report and all that. Amen? Not on bad stuff. All right, so that's our review from last week. I shared with you three testimonies of people who had outstanding comebacks. Say, I'm having... An outstanding, an outstanding comeback. comeback. Now I'm here to stand before you to tell you I am having an outstanding comeback. Amen. Lord. I can't tell you how outstanding my comeback is. But I am having an outstanding comeback. Oh, God's so good. So I shared Wilma Rudolph, who due to sickness in her life became paralyzed in one leg. Later she decided to become a runner. And eventually she went on to three, win three Olympic gold medals in running. Say so she had a comeback. Chester Carlson's ideas were rejected by 20 corporations until he approached the Halloid Company who purchased the rights to his electrostatic paper copying process and Halloid's name was later changed to Xerox Corporation. And now they have over 16 billion in assets. In the Bible, the Apostle Peter. <laughs> when you want to have a pity party, just think about the Apostle Peter. I mean, here's a man that walked on the water, for goodness sakes. Here's a man that witnessed the miracles of Jesus, feeding the thousands and raising people from the dead and all the stuff he saw Jesus do. And what does he do? He denies him. What? To save his own skin. Amen. So he denies him, but later he is restored. Everybody say restored. He has a comeback. And he preaches the first sermon of the New Testament church. Amen. And thousands of people get saved. Talk about a comeback. Amen. Sometimes we forget these people in the Bible as to how honorary they were sometimes. <coughs> now you know how honorary you are. Or were. But, but think about something. Moses was a murderer. Okay? Moses was a murderer. And what did God do with him? He delivered his people. That's right. That's right. Amen. Yep. Say comebacks, comebacks are supernatural. Are supernatural. <laughs> and we could go on and on and on, and I, I will share some others with you in a minute. So today we're looking, we're going to look at this theme beginning with Jeremiah 30, 17. This is one of my favorite scriptures for people that are hospitalized, that have any kind of surgery. This is one I stood on. Jeremiah 30, 17 says, For I will what? can't do that for I will restore health to you say that with me for I will restore health to you now again God loves me more than you so he's restoring my health say God loves me as much as the pastor all right so that promise says I will restore health to you so you got to get out of your stinking thinking that you're never going to be any better the things are never going to improve, that you're always going to be like this the rest of your life. I, I really like to apply this to people that have been in accidents of some kind. They've been in a car accident, or uh, they fell and had an accident, or what, whatever. You know, and, and the mindset sometimes is, I, I, I'm never going to get any better. I, I'm going to have to deal with this the rest of my life. Well, that's not what this is. God says, I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds. Now, God said that. Now, the doctor says this. But God says this. So I appreciate the doctor. I've never looked at any of my doctors and said, what you talking about? Okay. They're reading their facts. But I'm reading the truth. 
And the truth says, God will restore health to me. Yes. Say that with me. God will restore health to me. So you put your faith toward that. God will restore health to me. Well, I don't know how that's going to happen. Well, I don't either. That's right. But I'm just responsible for believing it. Amen. 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 So I just believe God will restore health to me. And it goes on to say, and will heal me of my wounds. And I look at that again in regard to accidents, again in regard to surgeries. You know, people... People have said to me sometimes before surgery, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going in for surgery, Pastor, and I want you to pray I don't hurt. Well, I can't pray that. If I go out here and I get a paper cut on my finger, guess what? <laughs> it talks to me. That hurts. That's right. yeah, it does. Okay? That hurts. So if they get in there and they cut you wide open and they do some stuff to you, uh, it takes a little time. And we're so impatient. Gee whiz, we're so impatient. Why do we have two windows at McDonald's? Why do we have two windows at Burger King? Because we're impatient. We want to pull up that second window, and they better be handing that stuff out the window when we get up there. I mean, my wife and I got in Taco Bell drive through the other day, and again, I don't recommend Taco Bell if you've had a heart attack. But anyway, uh, I won't tell you what I had to eat. But anyway... <coughs> We're sitting in, in line at Taco Bell, and this guy that's ordering, he's ordering, and he's ordering, and he's ordering, and he's ordering, and he's ordering. I'm like, gee whiz, is he feeding the county? What is he, what is he ordering up there? <laughs> and then finally he moved on, and the next guy moves up, and he's ordering, and he's ordering, and he's ordering. I'm like, gee whiz, people, don't you know what you want when you get up to the window? So we must have sat in that Taco Bell line for 15 minutes to, before we even got to order. I told her we should have walked in and ordered. Wow. Amen? We're just so impatient. You know, if you go in the grocery store, well, I shouldn't say grocery store, go in, go in Walmart and there's 35 registers, and how many are open? Two. Two. <laughs> if you're fortunate, two. Two are open. And where's the line? All Halfway right. back the aisle, you know. And, of course, that person in front of you had to have a full cart or whatever they're getting. They couldn't have just three items. Um and we, and we get so impatient with that. Like, we want, to, we want to get things moving. So we're looking around like, you know, open another register. Do something. But it doesn't happen. So you just got to stand there. Say patience. patience. Okay. So restore means to bring back to a former or original condition. That's the Webster's Dictionary definition. To bring back to a former or original condition. For example, how many have ever restored a piece of furniture? Yes. All right. Uh, I used to work with a man, uh, Lonnie Eppert. And he could restore furniture. And we got in a piece of furniture one time. I worked for a furniture store when I got back from school. And it was split right down the middle. It was a coffee table. It was split right down the middle. And the boss looked at him and said, can you do anything with that? And he said, yeah. I said, I can fix that. So I went back and saw it in a couple of days. And he had repaired that crack down the middle. And you couldn't tell it was ever there. I mean, he had a gift for doing that kind of stuff. How many have ever restored an automobile? I've got a, uh, what is he, a nephew. I've got a nephew that's restoring a car that was given to him, and he's doing it little by little because he works full time, and he does this on the side. And he likes to put his pictures on Facebook of the progress he's making. So he will get it eventually restored to its original condition. All right? How many of you have ever tried to restore a house? How many know it takes more work to restore a house than to build a new one? Amen. Can you hear it? Amen, 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 amen. You got a man back here doing it all every day. Okay. It just takes more work to restore it. And the, the thing that frustrates me about restoration, especially in an old building like I'm in, nothing's square. I mean, just nothing's square. Just forget it. You, you're not going to end up with a pretty job when you get done. You just do what you do. But I thank God I got a wife that don't care about all that, so... We're good to go. So that's what restoration is in regard to the natural definition. But listen to the biblical definition. The biblical definition of restoring means increased, multiplied, or improved so that it's better than its original state. I tell you, when I get through what I'm going through right now, I'm going to be better than my original state. Yes. Yes, amen. I want you to know right now I'm wearing pants where they're supposed to be worn. I'm not wearing them down here underneath the belly. God. You know, they say all men over 60 have size 30. Mm. Matter of fact, I went to Subway the other day and I wore a regular pair of pants, which was a mistake. And I didn't have my suspenders on. 
And I come out of Subway and I feel something back here and I'm like, and my pants are halfway down my leg. Cause my belt, I couldn't get tight enough to hold my pants up. Everybody say that's a good problem. Okay. All right. So when we think of restoring back to better than its original, the first thought that came to me was Job. Remember Job? He, is, he has lost everything. He's lost all of his children. He's lost all of his livestock. He's lost all of his servants. He didn't lose his wife. <laughs> and she was a peach. If you haven't read that scripture, she was a peach. She's the one that came to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Anyway. So anyway, after, after what he went through, and most scholars say that only lasted nine months of his life. It wasn't nine years. It wasn't 90 years. It was only nine, year, nine months of his life that his trials and all that went on. And TV is not necessarily a good thing. And I was watching this one program, and, and they talked about Job. And, and it wasn't a Christian program. But they talked about Job and, and how he suffered and how God did all this to him. Well, that's not what the Bible said. The Bible doesn't say God did all that to him. It says who did? Satan, Satan did it to him. Not God. And how did the hedge come down? Fear. Through his fear. Yeah. He said out of his own lips, what I greatly feared has come upon me. So you've got to watch your stinking thinking in regard to fear and faith. You're either in one or the other. Yep. You're either in fear or faith. And I tell you, I've been both sides of that, and faith is better. Faith. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So in Job 42, verse 10, the Lord restored, everybody say restored. The Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Whoa. What did we just do this morning? There you go. Amen. Amen. We prayed for people that offended us. Amen. All right. So Job, whew, some of you got in a position supernaturally today by that prayer that you haven't been in before because you've harbored unforgiveness against people for things they have done or said or acted toward you. But because you operated in the supernatural today by, by praying that prayer and meaning it from your heart, then you put yourself in a different position. A comeback position. A comeback position. Amen. Woo! That's all off the press there. I tell you, that's good stuff. <laughs> all right. So, the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job, who knows the answer, Twice as much as he had before. So when God restores people, he doesn't just re return it to its original condition. He does it twice as much. Amen. 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 And then it goes on in verse 17 and it says, Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. After this, Job lived 140 years. Whew. After all that. And saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days. Say, I'll die old and full of days if Jesus tarries. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm ready. Amen. I mean, he let me stay here, but I'm ready. Amen. But we got a work to do, don't we? Okay. I ran into a preacher in the post office yesterday, and that's dangerous when you run into a preacher in the post office because you get talking. And you get talking, and you get talking. And we stood there for an hour and talked to each other in the post office. <laughs> and preached a little, but it was fun. He also had had heart surgery, so we really got talking about that. Now, the rainbow that you see out here on a, on a rainy day, and the sun shines, what, what, what kind of rainbow do you see? You see a rainbow in the sky, and sometimes you see a double rainbow in the sky. And what's that a symbol of? It's a promise of God that he won't destroy the earth again by rain. Now, some days in my house, I'm wondering about that promise. <laughs> when, the, when the waters start dripping, you know, places. But I, I know it's the truth. And, and it just thrills me to see a rainbow. And when I see a double rainbow, it, it just, it's way out there. Amen? So it's a symbol of God's comeback, of man's comeback, and a sign of God's covenant to restore the earth after the flood. Now, Joseph's life was a comeback story. We're not going to get into everything about Joseph today. But he, number one, was forsaken by his family. And some of you out there may be forsaken by your family. Been there, done that. All right? So I know what you're talking about. 
You may be forsaken by your family. Number two, he was falsely accused. Oh, man. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all been falsely accused by something in life. Number three, he was seemingly forgotten. Oh, don't we? That's when pity party time comes. When you feel like, oh, gee, where is God? Where is the church? Where is the pastor? Where is everybody? I just feel so forgotten. I don't feel like anybody cares about me anymore. Well, let me tell you this, that God cares about you. Amen. Amen. And we care about you. We just don't always know what's going on between your ears. Amen. 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 Okay, I'm almost done. <laughs> so he was seemingly forgotten. And in the end, he experienced God's favor. Say God's favor. God's favor. He was number two man in the nation of Egypt. Everybody say, wow. wow. Number two man in the nation of Egypt. But he was forsaken by his family. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. He was put in prison. But in the end, he experienced God's favor. And I want you to know that part of your comeback will be God's favor in your life. Say, it's time for a comeback. It's time for a comeback. Favor is one of God's promises for each of us. Say, I'm favored of God. I'm favored of God. So we got to turn from our attempts at earning God's favor by our works and come to Him in faith, receiving His grace, which is His unmerited favor. Say, I receive God's unmerited favor. I receive God's unmerited favor. You don't have to earn it. You're part of the family. Amen? Amen? President Trump's son doesn't have to get up in the morning and wonder if his needs are going to be met. Amen. He's married to a billionaire. Amen. All right? Plus the President of the United States. So he doesn't have to worry about his needs being met. And you shouldn't worry about it either. That's right. Amen. Amen? Amen? My God shall supply all. It doesn't say some. <laughs> My God shall supply all. All my need according to riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The only problem between that happening from God and you is you. Well, right. oh, we don't ever have any money. I don't ever have any extra money. Well, I can't buy this and I can't do that. Well, can't shouldn't be part of our vocabulary. Amen. Because the Bible says, I can do all. all things through Christ. All things through Christ. All things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, sometimes I don't feel like I can do all things. We'll get your feelings out of the way. How many going to go to work Monday morning? Amen. You going to feel like it? Maybe not. Huh? You going to feel like you going to get up Monday morning and go, Oh, I really feel like going to work this morning. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. Well, you should be thankful Amen. that you got a job. Amen. When I run into young people at the grocery store and they're like, Yeah, I get off in two hours. And I can tell by that attitude that they just really don't want to be there. I said, well, thank God you've got a job. Right. Well, they immediately start turning around and go, well, yeah, I, I am thankful I have a job. Because they probably have friends that don't have jobs. Right. Amen? Amen? All right, let's wrap this up. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes in order to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's the thief? The devil. The devil. Jesus said, I've come that they might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Now, you might be enjoying life, but maybe it's not overflowing yet like you'd like it to. Well, it's time for a comeback. Amen. It's time to hook in with some supernatural forces and the love of God and the power of God in your life so you can have a comeback and you can live life to its running over. How do you know somebody's running over? Well, they're not walking around like this. How are you? All right. All right. No, they're just beaming. Right? Like she is. She beams. All right. Joan beams. Look at her. She's beaming now. When she came into service today, she was. But she's beaming now. Why? Because the word's feeding her spirit. The worship is feeding her spirit. The testimonies are feeding her spirit. I tell you, if you go and don't feed your spirit, you'll get. Like that too. You got to feed your spirit. Because Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen. So, what does restoration mean to the church? We are the church. John 13, 34, and 35 says, A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Oh, as I have loved you. Amen. As I have loved you. Amen. How much does Jesus love you? Amen. To the utmost. Yep. Unconditionally. All right. <laughs> to love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
Why is the church in such a mess today in the world? Because we haven't shown that kind of love. We've shown division. We've shown differences in doctrine. Right? We haven't shown the love of God. Why did Jesus show up in the first place? He showed up to show people that God is love. He's not judgment. He's not commandments. He's not do this and don't do this kind of a God. He's a God that loves us and forgives us. Amen. Thank God for His give, forgiveness. Yeah. Number one, believers who operate in agape love, which is unconditional love. Number two, believers who release God's power without measure through the church. When I first thought of that, I thought, without measure through the church. It says Jesus had the Spirit without measure. All right? And we are the body of Christ so we collectively have the spirit without measure but if we're not here we're lacking amen, amen. amen. just imagine in Melinda's life today if Joan hadn't shown up sure. she got a breakthrough today because Joan showed up amen. I remember prophesying to somebody one time I got it during praise and worship and I was getting ready to do it and I looked down and they were gone they left early so I prophesied to the chair where they were sitting because that was a word for them so you got to be in the right place at the right time every day amen. especially in church amen? amen number three operations of the gifts of the spirit the devil wants to shut down the gifts of the spirit he doesn't want people praying in tongues he doesn't want prophecies he doesn't want tongues interpretation he wants to shut all that down and believe it or not spirit filled organizations are helping him with that we had a local church, a woman got up and prophesied in one day, and they believe in this, they say, and the elders came up to her afterwards and said, don't ever do that again. Don't ever do that again. Well, you better watch that. Hello. Number four, it's time the church grows up. It's time to quit being babies. I've been around a lot of Christians for a lot of years, and believe you me, a lot of Christians are still toddlers. When it comes to spirituality, they don't know how to talk. They let the awful stuff come out of their mouth. Oh, that just kills me. That just kills me. I tell you, that scared me to death. I wouldn't be saying any of that. You shouldn't be saying it either. And number five, we got to reach the world for Jesus. Amen. Well, am I still here to reach the world for Jesus? And I'm reaching the world through you. Amen? So once you go out the doors, you enter the mission field. Doesn't have to be over in Costa Rica. Mission field's out there. Lots of sinners out there. They're starting a new church in Spotswood High School. Good. I got a letter in the mail. They're starting a new church in Spotswood High School. I thought, good. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not intimidated by a new church starting. I'm not intimidated by a church, another church down here in the mall. I wish the whole mall was full of churches. Drive by Chanel and pick your church. <laughs> Bring them on. Let's have a church on every corner. We almost do an Elkton already. So anyway. All right. It says time for my comeback. All right. We prayed with you last week. We're going to pray again. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you that from your word we get encouragement. We get inspiration. We get faith. Faith from your word. And Father God, we have faith for a comeback. A supernatural comeback. So right now, Father God, we submit our will to your will. We don't want to go out doing our thing. We want to go out doing your thing. And we want your will, the very desires of your heart, to be the desires of our heart. And I pray for this congregation today in regard to breakthroughs, in regard to a comeback. I believe some have experienced it already today during this service, Father. I believe some have got ignited today because of this service. Because, Father, we, we have felt your presence we have sensed the move of your spirit, Father God. It's been a good day in the house of God. Hallelujah. So we pray, Father God, as we go from here today, we go in the power of your spirit. We are overcomers in this life, and we will overcome all the deceptions that the enemy has out there. And we receive by faith our supernatural comebacks in Jesus' name. Jesus name. And all God's people said, yes. Amen. Amen.